A tech entrepreneur answers the call to run for public office, and one of her digital proposals is to help San Diego's homeless. That statement took a steel spine to stand up and say no. A fierce pushback on Capitol Hill. A California senator sounds off on the president's first 100 days. It's kind of awesome that, you know, Video Game Archive here just has pretty much anything you can think of. Any game you would really want to play, you can play. And tapping into the nostalgia of video games, plus how they help power academic work. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Monet. A group of advocates and city council members are calling on San Diego to tackle the 15 intersections that have seen the most fatalities and accidents in the last 15 years. KPBS reporter Steve Walsh has the story. We're out here at the corner of University and Marlboro, which is considered one of the deadliest intersections in San Diego for pedestrians. And a group is saying all it would take is some simple fixes like installing new signals or painting the crosswalks to make it safer. The intersection is one of what Circulate San Diego is calling the 15 deadliest in the city. According to Kathleen Ferrer, the group is asking the city to make some relatively small improvements. Please look at the data where crashes are more likely to happen and fix those intersections, especially with simple solutions that we think can cost you know, less than uh, $15,000 per intersection. She says the city often responds to complaints, though accident data shows University in Marlboro is actually the worst in the city. A combination of high traffic and a lot of pedestrians has left 18 people either killed or injured over the last 15 years. In fact, five of the 15 worst intersections on the list are along sections of University Avenue. Together. Newly elected city council member Georgette Gomez says her area has long been neglected. Historically, I mean, we are in a community that that has been ignored for far too long. Overall, 2016 was the third year in a row that pedestrian deaths increased in San Diego. Reporting from the intersection of University and Marlboro, Steve Walsh, KPBS News. San Diego County Supervisor Diane Jacob kicked off an historic seventh term in office and she delivered the State of the County Address today. KPBS reporter Allison St. John says the San Diego Families Coalition delivered their own version immediately following Jacob's speech. So Supervisor Diane Jacob has been on the board for 25 years and since this is her last four-year term it's interesting to see what she chose to focus on in her State of the County Address. She is the chair this year, and she talked about seven, in honor of her seventh term, seven things that the county could do to serve the public better. They included a lot of things, including improving roads, building more parks, stopping sexual slavery, and uh, developing more apps to make the county more efficient. But the thing that Diane Jacob focused on most was seniors, and specifically seniors with Alzheimer's or dementia. She doubled down on the Alzheimer's initiative that she started three years ago and said she would like to hire a new top administrator to coordinate the county's services to seniors. The person picked for this job would serve as our top advocate for the elderly. A sort of eh, senior czar, big cheese, head honcho, you get the idea. A high profile leader is needed to make sure that all the appropriate arms of county government are working together the best that they can and to meet the needs of seniors, especially those with dementia. So after the State of the County Address, a group called San Diego Families held a rally and uh, declared that the real state of the county was quite different. David Trujillo from the ACLU said that in the case of mental health, the county is still more focused on punishment than on prevention. Since 2009, there's been an 84% increase in mental health calls, and yet more and more of these people continue to end up in jails because we're not providing the proper services that they need. So also at the rally, the Center on Policy Initiatives came out with a new report suggesting that one-third of working families cannot afford to make ends meet. They asked whether, in fact, in the budget, the county might be providing more services for uh, low-income families and working to provide better-paid jobs in the county. 
Diane Jacob, in an interview after the speech, said that she was hoping to use this uh, model that they would develop for working with seniors as a model that would help with working with other people who have mental health issues and who need social services. If we develop a model here, it will help to develop a model for other types of issues and other age groups and other people that need help. But in order to be successful, we need to start small. She is in her last term. She'll be termed out in four years, but she enlisted the help of Kristen Gaspar, the newest uh, county supervisor who will be on the board for four years and could potentially carry on this legacy. In the KPBS newsroom, I'm Allison St. John. Twelve more people in San Diego have died from the flu. Health officials say that brings the total so far this season up to 33. That's 24 more than this time last year. The CDC recommends getting flu vaccinations and says they're especially important for the elderly, pregnant women, and people with weak immune systems. State and local lawmakers are looking to halt natural gas injections at Aliso Canyon until they can figure out what caused the major leak that started in October of 2015. Today, the Los Angeles City Council voted to support a state Senate bill to prevent a Southern California Gas Company from resuming further storage operations. There is a public hearing on the issue in L.A. tonight. SoCal gas officials say the facility has passed rigorous inspections. Factories may have a new incentive to reduce industrial pollution under legislation introduced today at the state capitol. Lawmakers are calling it the Buy Clean California Act, and it would require state agencies to evaluate a manufacturer's environmental record before making purchases for infrastructure projects. The author says California currently buys too many products like cement, glass, and steel from factories with poor environmental records. And we want to change that. We think that our public dollars, our, our billions of dollars in buying power should be aligned with our environmental goals. And we should be rewarding uh, clean manufacturers and encouraging others who aren't clean yet to become clean. Supporters of the bill say it can play a big role in helping California reach its climate goal of reducing toxic emissions by 40 percent in the next 13 years. San Diego medical researchers say they've discovered a new way to fight cancer on two fronts. Researchers co-led by a UC San Diego professor developed a molecule that disrupts both a protein and an enzyme responsible for cancer growth. The researchers are hoping their molecule can lead to a new class of cancer fighting drugs. How well do you know your city council member? To help you get better acquainted, we're continuing our series of profiles of San Diego City Council members. Today, KPBS reporter Claire Tregesser talked to newly elected Barbara Bree, who represents District 1. This is theft. Yes. This is car theft. Car theft uh, right. Blue is drugs. City right. Councilwoman Barbara Bree is checking out a crime app made by ninth grader Matthew Smith. She's visiting the League of Amazing Programmers, a class that teaches kids how to code. Yep. This is fantastic. Yes, yeah, so you can sort of see around San Diego what the different um, <clears throat> crime rates are for different. Uh, for Bree, crime rates are more than just something in an app. Can you go to Pacific Beach? I'm just curious. Yeah, Last month, she became the new council member representing La Jolla, Carmel Valley, and University City. I, Barbara Bree, do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. But she's known she'd won the office since August. My husband and I were on vacation. We were coming back from Wyoming, and we were sitting in the Salt Lake Airport. She got a call from Republican Ray Ellis, who was supposed to run against her. And I had a, a feeling why he was calling, and uh, he told me he was suspending his campaign, um, and if I could just keep it quiet. Bree has a background as an entrepreneur. Give mom something to smile about with a dozen roses for just $19.99. She founded ProFlowers.com and worked at the tech incubator Connect. Then she was pulled into running for public office. The street in front of my office in La Jolla Shores had been torn up a few times and to have the same work done over and over again. And at a family dinner almost three years ago, I was taught my daughter Rachel was visiting from Chicago at the time. My daughter, older daughter Sarah was there and it just evolved. They said, Mom, you should run for city council. And that's, that's how it started. Congratulations, Mom. Thank you. <laughs>
I am going to second the nomination of Council Member Cole to be the next president of the City Council. In her first week on the job, she faced her first big decision. Please vote who to support as city council president. There was a contentious race between David Alvarez and Myrtle Cole, and Bree cast a deciding vote for Cole. Congratulations, President-elect Myrtle Cole. I respect Myrtle a great deal. She's done a lot for her district, and I felt she would bring um, very effective leadership. Council President Cole, here. Bree is specifically looking for leadership on building more housing and addressing homelessness. She wants a central database of all homeless people in the county. So if Joe or Jane were had an interaction with um, a police officer or a social worker in Escondido yesterday and in downtown San Diego today, we wouldn't know that it was the same person and what the interactions were. Right, whatever you don't want, just leave and we'll get it cleaned up. She also says she supports building denser housing, including projects already underway in University City in Carmel Valley. Come visit our community and tour your new home. But if new dense projects were proposed that people in her district didn't like, would she stand up to them? Listen, you're going to look at each project on its own merits. One of the next challenges for the city council will be deciding what to do with Qualcomm Stadium now that the Chargers are leaving. Bree hopes to give some of the land to San Diego State University. SDSU is landlocked. They can't provide enough housing for their students. Um, so I would hope that an educational complex, including SDSU, is part of the conversation, a river park, um, housing for students and faculty, perhaps other housing. But I think what's most important is that we have to have a community conversation. It's not something any of one person can dictate. We need you to uh, learn everything that you're learning and then to uh, stay in San Diego. That's back the at the coding class for kids, Bree is back. evaluating a different kind of project. So what, what project are you working on? What uh, I'm working on this robot tortoise thing. Sixth grader Dasha Zerboni tells her she's working on programming robots mm -hmm. since that's one of her weak points. Well, I'm very impressed with what you're doing and you should stay at it. I definitely like will. Yeah, we need more programmers. Bree plans to stay at it on her job, too. Claire Tregesser, KPBS News. You can see more member profiles at kpbs.org slash city council. On Capitol Hill, there's no sign of a break in party hostility over President Trump's cabinet nominees. Senate Republicans pushed two of them through committee votes today. But the senior senator from California led another pushback. Senator Dianne Feinstein says she'll vote against the attorney general nomination of Jeff Sessions. And she praised Sally Yates, who refused to enforce the president's travel ban. That statement took a steel spine to stand up and say no. It took the courage of Elliot Richardson and William Ruckelshaus, who stood up to President Nixon. That is what an attorney general must be willing and able to do. I have no confidence that Senator Sessions will do that. Feinstein will also have a chance to review the president's pick to serve on the highest court in the land, George Neil Gorsuch. In a statement, she expressed concerns about the president's litmus test for a justice nominee. She pointed out his campaign promised to focus on a candidate who will overturn Roe versus Wade that legalized abortion. She also said Gorsuch's record was a long one. It will take a long time to conduct a thorough review. From our sister station in San Francisco, KQED's political editor, Scott Schaefer, talked to the senator about her top priorities during the president's first 100 days in office. This is going to be your fourth presidential transition, I believe, yeah. uh, right? Bush to Clinton, Clinton to Bush, and then to Obama, and now to Donald Trump. How does this period compare with the others? I think in my time, this is a very unusual and a very unique time. And it causes me great pause because uh, the one thing America needs to do is be constant, be constant with the world, be constant with our values, uh, bring the country together, don't separate it. And it's hard to see some of those 
prevailing efforts happening because he appears to be very impetuous uh, and he, he appears to uh, respond um, in ways that others wouldn't. You, you know, somebody says something about you, you tend to ignore it when you're in office. I think very strongly that what he is, needs to do is bring this nation together because there is a lot of fear out there. And there's fear particularly in California with where things are going. We have a large number of immigrants. California is a very diverse state and people are worried. We're worried about their future. Are you hearing from your constituents about oh, that? Oh yeah, oh yeah, thousands. And you, you know, particularly uh, the dreamers um, who are students for the most part, and they're worried, are they gonna get picked up in the middle of the night? There was a Congressional Budget Office report out this week saying that up to 18 million people across the country could lose their health insurance if the ACA is scrapped and not replaced. Do, do, is there a moral imperative here? Well, five million of those are in California. So the answer to your question is yes, there is a huge moral dilemma here. I am strongly opposed to repeal. Um, my belief is that there ought to be a series of hearings, maybe twice a week uh, for a period of months, and every part of the Obamacare pro uh, program should be looked at, particularly the individual marketplace, because that's where the rates, the premiums have gone up so much. But I think uh, this business of having to rush as opposed to b approaching it from an operational point of view with caution and piece by piece beginning with this individual marketplace. I want to ask you about Russia. A uh, lot of concern on Russian involvement uh, with hacking the DNC, trying to push the election toward Donald Trump. Are you surprised there isn't more outrage on both sides of the aisle or do you feel there is among your Republican colleagues? Oh, I think there's plenty of outrage. Um, take out the partisan part of it. Nobody wants another, another country manipulating the election, not the election results, because that, that wasn't manipulated, but the election actually with propaganda, with disinformation, with hacking, with release of anything that they think can compromise the candidacy of any individual in any election. That is destruction of our democracy. When you look ahead to the first hundred days uh, and beyond, but especially this first few months, what, con what concerns you the most? Because there's so many things to choose from. Well, what rises to the very top for me is the national security of our country. And uh, we have major problems. And I worry a lot, I'll be very candid with you, about North Korea. We have an unpredictable leader who is on his way to a major uh, nuclear bomb inventory and secondly, an intercontinental ballistic missile that can deliver an, uh, a nuclear bomb uh, to the United States. That is a real and present danger. Uh, you have a big decision to make next year about whether to run for re-election. There are a lot of young younger Democrats in California itching to run for your seat, as you know. Uh, what would you say to them? Uh, well, and have you made up your mind about No, I will. As long as I feel I can get things done, and I can, then I think I benefit the people of my state, uh, as opposed to someone new coming in. And if I can continue to produce, then I will continue to produce. If I believe I can't, either by health or any other way, I won't. But as long as I believe I can, I will. We'll have more on the president's first 100 days in office, and we'll follow developments with Feinstein and the California delegation on air and online at kpbs.org. Coming up tonight on the PBS NewsHour, the first television interview with Vice President Mike Pence since the inauguration. I, I'm, I'm very comfortable with the fact that there's only one person in charge in the Trump administration, and that's President Donald Trump. So my baby hasn't been ill since birth. He has good, very good reflexes. He's pink. He's not pale. What's my name, Kama? 
So it's looking generally very beautiful and healthy. The changes to a common cooking tool that could help save lives in Ghana. That's tonight on the PBS NewsHour, starting at 7, right here on KPBS. Fog took over the morning skies in Oceanside today, and it looks like it's going to be a pretty cloudy night. Sinead Shocker has tonight's forecast. Well, if we take a look at our satellite and radar, we're continuing to see an area of low pressure push on shore. Plenty of moisture off towards the northern coastal regions of California and into the northwest as well. However, taking a closer look down south, well, Los Angeles, San Diego, not quite getting so much here. Even the cloud cover really missing uh, the spot right now. However, as we head throughout tonight into tomorrow, chances of cloudier weather as well as maybe a spottier shower out towards San Bernardino County as well as into Orange County going to definitely be possible. But as far as San Diego County is concerned, not so much uh, really anything going on over the last six hours. And that's pretty much going to be the story as we continue into tomorrow. So for tonight, 50 degrees for our low, partly cloudy conditions. Nothing abnormal here. Then we work our way into tomorrow. That heavy fog definitely possible throughout the morning hours. But overnight, we're going to start to see that build in. San Diego, 50 degrees, 47 for Chula Vista and Alpine 38 and 26 out towards Mount Laguna. So still staying relatively cold. Now working our way into Thursday, as I said, that rainfall possible down around the Los Angeles area, more so held off towards the north. However, heavy mountain snow going to come with this system. But for much of the southwest, we're going to remain pretty dry here throughout the rest of our weekend. So as we head out towards the coast, we're also going to start to see a cooling trend with that onshore flow across much of the region. So 67 to wrap up our work week here on our Friday with lots of sunshine, a low of 50 degrees. Then we work our way into the weekend. Temperature is going to drop back down into the mid to lower 60s with some cloudier weather coming on Monday as we do see another chance of uh, some light rain uh, with another system coming on shore. Now we take a look inland, pretty much the same story as usual. 72 degrees for Thursday and Friday, sunny skies here. Into our weekend, we're going to cool off into the mid to low, or the mid to upper 60s for Saturday and Sunday. We'll have a mixture of clouds and sun throughout much of that weekend. Saturday looks like your best day to get some of those glimpses of sunshine in there. By Monday, we're at 66 degrees. Into the mountains we go, and we're cooling back off into the mid to upper 50s for the weekend though we are seeing mostly sunny conditions here as well. Very light breezes, so we're not talking about any gusty winds or anything like that. Our lows as we hit Saturday going to be just below freezing at 31 degrees, and we'll stay in those 30s through Sunday and into your work week next week. Out towards the deserts, beautiful weather here. We are sunny and right around 75 degrees for us as we wrap up our week, and that's going to stick with us through the weekend as well. We'll get some more sun as we head into Monday and back to work. For KPBS News, I'm Shanae Shocker. As we count down to Super Bowl 51 on Sunday, how about the San Diego Raiders? That was the question asked of NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell today at a Super Bowl press conference. The Chargers left the queue behind in Mission Valley, but NFL leaders say don't count on San Diego for a new home for the Raiders. And I think for any team to relocate to San Diego at this point in time, we're going to have to find a solution to that stadium problem, and one that we couldn't do after probably 15 years of effort. The Raiders want to move to Las Vegas, but a major donor backed out. The University of Michigan houses are, has an archive with over 7,000 titles. But these aren't musty manuscripts. It's an archive of video games. AP reporter Mike Householder says the best part is it's hands-on and open to the public. A couple of guys playing Call of Duty. A scene that plays out in basement rec rooms across the country. This one happens to be in a college library. What? How do you even do that, man? The University of Michigan's computer and video game archive features 7,000 titles, all of which are available for the public to use. It's 100% free. Jeremy Bolin comes in three or four times a week. It's kind of awesome that, you know, video game archive here just has pretty much anything you can think of. Any game you would really want to play, you can play. Now in its 10th year, the CVGA is more hands-on than your typical academic archive. 
Games from the 1970s to today are preserved here. But I think there's also a place for an archive like ours that encourages people to come in and, and use and experience uh, the games. Trey McAllister stops by sometimes before heading to work at a local pizza place. It's a great place to come hang out and just relax with your friends and, you know, do something engaging. It's not all fun and games at the archive. Instructors hold classes here and researchers tap into it too, including using a racing game to analyze the dangers of texting while driving. It's incumbent on research libraries to be looking forward to not only be collecting the stuff for current uses, but also thinking about what in the future people are going to want to study. And I think um, as the years go by, as the decades go by, it'll become increasingly important to have a, a good archival uh, collection of, of games for people to study. And to remember the games of their youth. <laughs> Mike Householder, Associated Press, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Yeah, I feel like there would be something like the Ken Bill. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.